This is Tommy's Outdoors 93. Today we're gonna talk about Amazon, the Amazon rainforest that is. And our guest is Dr. Alex Lees. Uh, Alex spent a lot of time in Amazon uh, doing his research and some other scientific work. Uh, Alex currently is a senior lecturer in conservation biology in the Department of Natural Sciences at the Manchester Metropolitan University. Uh, and at this point, shout outs to Manchester Metropolitan University and shout outs to the wider scientific community. Uh, there is a lot of episodes of the podcast where I talk with uh, scientists, PhD students, uh, postdocs, uh, lecturers, etc. It's always great pleasure to talk to you guys. And if you or you know someone who does very interesting research or want to showcase your paper or maybe you want to showcase your university or your department, uh, you know how to grab a hold of me, tommysoutdoors.com. Send me a message and it's always a pleasure to uh, talk about science uh, related to wildlife, environment, conservation, etc. Um, okay, so let's go back to today's episode. We're gonna talk about Amazon as a whole, as an ecosystem. And also we're gonna talk about, well, the destruction of Amazon. Um, but don't worry, it's not as doom and gloom as I thought it's gonna be. Uh, so there's a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge. We're going to talk about land use. We're going to talk about um, fires and and whether what we see in media is accurate or not. You will find out listening to this episode. And um, yeah, so uh, as usual, before I let you uh, enjoy this episode of the podcast, a reminder that the podcast is available on any and all podcasting platforms in and YouTube. Uh, unless you're watching that on YouTube right now, then I'm stating the obvious. And please uh, give me a like, rate the podcast, leave the comment, follow. This is helping me greatly end the podcast with all sorts of algorithms. So uh, that's the best way for you to support uh, what I do by engaging on social media and by engaging on all the various platforms by rating, commenting, uh, liking, whatever, whatever any particular platform implemented um so yeah and uh i think that's it and now without any further ado ladies and gentlemen dr alex lees and the amazon rainforest Alex, welcome to the show. Thanks, thanks for being here with us. Okay, thank you for the invitation, Tommy. It's good to hear you. Um, you spend a lot of time on Twitter. How are you doing this? You're, you're all, you always, see you always responding, but the amount of like a educational value is really tremendous. Yeah, so I see um, as an academic, I see it being a great role to not only sort of keep in contact. Uh, and see what exciting science has also been coming out, but also to engage in some of these really interesting policy disputes. And I certainly learn a lot. And I feel that, you know, if, as academics, if we're not sort of reaching out uh, and using every channel to sort of influence debate in the public sphere, then I think we're, you know, we're not doing the right thing. So again, I think it's a, a pretty useful um, uh, thing, sort of fill in bits of my time in between Zoom calls, as we've just been discussing, or, or writing <laughs> papers, or supervising students, and right. I, I get a lot out of it, certainly. Yeah, yeah. So for for anyone listening to that who who don't know you from Twitter at Alexander underscore Lees, uh, go folks, give him a follow, um, because like like I said, there's a lot of uh, especially like uh, you have a lot of patience to kind of explaining things, and and I noticed that like many academics do, uh, it's kind of their their call of educating and kind of moderating and presenting facts and rather than jumping into like, oh, like this guy's and that guy. So that's, that's fantastic. Listen, we're here today to talk about the Amazon forest or, but can you maybe for a start as decipher the, the naming is like Amazon, Amazon forest, Amazonia, Amazon rainforest. Is it all the same things? Are there distinct different things? How, how to you know how what what terminology is 
correct to use? Um, well, they all cover something similar. Not all, not all of Amazonia is rainforest because it, it captures multiple other different types of uh, habitats. For instance, there are uh, areas of uh, semi-deciduous uh, sort of dry forest there, and there are Amazonian savannas, and there are lots of different types of forests which we can go on to talk about. But I mean, Amazonia basically describes this, you know, huge, great, big um, drainage basin which occupies almost half of South America, basically, uh, and, and captures the largest remaining extent of, of tropical forest, and which is spread across, you know, well, I guess about over 60% of it is in Brazil, about 10, 12% in Peru, about the same in Colombia, and then little bits in uh, Bolivia, Ecuador, French Guiana, Suriname, uh, Venezuela, etc. So, I mean, they're all, those sort of words are interchangeable, just worth bearing in mind that it's it's not some great big sort of homogenous forest and, and captures, you know, an immense amount of habitat diversity, although all the, uh, the, uh, the large part of it is is rainforest. Right. And, the, and this is, so it's not like, forest around the river, right? Because that's, I think, most of the uh, like casual understanding is like, oh, there's a river and there's like a forest around the river, but but it's sometimes hard to grasp the size of it because I, I presume all the uh, rivers that are that are uh, uh, coming into Amazon also is creating that big ecosystem. Yeah, so it's a, a basin full of superlatives, right? I mean, the Amazon is itself the largest river by discharge in the world by by some way. I think it's about 20% of all the global discharge of water, uh, fresh water is, comes from Amazonia essentially. And it's the sort of the second, I guess, second longest river. There's often debate about exactly where the head, headwaters of the, Nile, of the, the Amazon are uh, in the sort of up in the Andes and whether or not it might even be longer than the Nile, et cetera. But in terms of volume, it's certainly by far the largest. And then some of the Amazonian tributaries are themselves amongst the world's largest rivers. So you've got the Madeira and the Negro and the Tapajos and, and the Xingu and the, the Juruá. And these sort of come together to, to make what is kind of like a, almost an archipelago. You know, you shouldn't think of the Amazon as being this sort of one great big forest. It's more like, you know, a, a huge archipelago of huge areas of forest divided by these enormous rivers. And the rivers themselves are, are, are in huge. I mean, close to this sort of getting close to the mouth, the Amazon can be, you know, upwards of 10 kilometers wide. Uh, and even you know, the lower reaches of some of the tributaries like the Tapajos can be, you know, four or five kilometers wide. So these are sort of incredible barriers to, for dispersal for, for species. So you have, you know, different uh, species occurring in each of what we call these interfluvial regions. So the, the, the flu being the river and they all have their own unique faunas. So that's why one of the reasons why Amazon's so diverse is because it's like a series of, of these huge, great big islands separated by these massive rivers, basically. Wow, that's very interesting. Listen, so just to wind back a little bit and, 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 and give our listeners and viewers uh, some context, how did that start for you? How did you get involved in, in, in work in, in Amazon? Was it like you always wanted to go there since you were a little kid? Or was it like at some point there was an opportunity and it was like, oh, wow, that's fantastic. Yeah, it was at some point there was an opportunity and it was sort of a, a sliding doors moment. So I, I did my undergrad degree at the University of East Anglia in Norwich. Uh, uh, and in during that degree, I also spent a year in North America uh, and a girl who I knew there, she sent me after I'd finished my undergrad degree, this uh, uh, sort of American Birding Conservancy's magazine on like opportunities for birders. Uh, and having just finished my undergrad degree, I was sort of scouting around for things to do. And I was applying for all sorts of positions. I applied for like a sort of a position working in Hawaii, which in the end I couldn't do. It wasn't US natural, national. I applied to do some work in, the, in Antarctic. I ended up successfully uh, working at a bird observatory in Canada. Uh, and one of the things I applied to do was work as a, a volunteer guide um, at a, a lodge in the Southern Amazon. So I ended up spending sort of three months doing that. And then um, uh, I, one of the uh, now professors at UEA, Carlos Perez, he just had a, a PhD student starting on working on mammals there. And he was sort of scouting around for someone to look for birds. And given that I did my undergrad degree there, he sort of knew who I was and then knew that 
I spent quite a lot of time in the Southern Amazon learning the birds there. And I sort of fell into a PhD like that, essentially. And, you know, probably if I hadn't received that booklet on opportunities for birders, you know, maybe when I'd gone to Antarctica, this could have been a completely different conversation about penguins or something. And I guess that's how sort of research careers pan out. And then ever since then, I sort of maintained the, the Amazonia links. So I spent five years uh, living in the city, uh, city of Belém, working at the Museo Paraense Emilio Gelgi, so the, the Geldi Museum uh, in the state of Pará there. So it was two different postdocs uh, and continue to sort of do Amazon research to this day and which uh, sort of one of the um, uh, sort of founder members of this uh, large sort of research consortium, the Sustainable Amazon Network. So um, which is predominantly Brazilian researchers, but also a few of us from, from other sort of widely spaced uh, places around the world. Right. So it's like birding, the like birds was the angle that you started. So you're, you really was like a bird yeah, biology. I've been a, I've been a bird nerd. Um, a suit, well, I think I became a bird nerd once I realized that birds and dinosaurs were the same thing, essentially. Dinosaurs was my first uh -huh. love up to the age of about sort of seven, and then realized that birds were essentially also dinosaurs and paleontology fell by the wayside a little bit, but I'm still interested. Um, and it was all birds ever since then. And Wow. Oh, so, oh, this is like, like the dinosaur things. That's like completely like, uh, but so why are we on this subject? Because this is like also interesting to me. Like, is the, are the birds like essentially what, what's left and then evolved or were the kind of like a bird shaped dinosaurs already in the peak of, uh, of a dinosaur era and ones that we have here are just, just, remained because this is this is quite often at least from from my admittedly uneducated perspective is like okay are we we did we have these you know lizard like creatures they died and few lizard like creatures survive and then they evolve in birds but recently is more of a like no 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 the dinosaurs already they had the, all sorts of feathers and all sorts of like a bird like features so what's the latest on 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 this yeah, so birds ero uh, evolved from a, a lineage of, uh, of theropod dinosaurs. So they're essentially one part of the, the dinosaur family tree, if you like. And, and many other dinosaurs had feathers. So feathers aren't uniquely bird thing. They're, they're not currently uniquely bird thing because all the other dinosaurs that had feathers went extinct. And they were basically a lineage of, of small dinosaurs. And they managed to survive the impact of this extraterrestrial bolide, which hit us 65 million years ago and entirely reset the course of evolution, essentially. And so they essentially just are a lineage of, of dinosaurs. But, you know, that's what we call them birds. And that's that's their story. So, I mean, there was nothing particularly uh, unique uh, amongst them. And there was lots of birds which went extinct when that asteroid hit as well. But some of them survived because they were small and, and, and warm-blooded and had enough sort of traits to, to scavenge and find food or whatever. They managed to sort of see through that big sort of bottleneck in, in evolution, which, which hit us, basically. Wow. And th that's not a recent, that, that is very recent, right? That development. As far I don't know what's, what's recent, but at, at, up to some point, they were, you know, that that wasn't like a mainstream that the dinosaurs had feathers and so on. I, I remember because I, I, I interested in dinosaurs also since I was a little kid. And what I recall that at some point, it started appearing those like, well, they, they might have feathers. Well, actually, they, they had feathers. And, they can, and that's, so how, how, how long ago we came to the conclusion that actually that feather dinosaurs or birds are much earlier than we well, thought? So we've, we've known about ancient birds, I mean, from the sort of time of Archaeopteryx, so for a very, very long time. But essentially, the birds don't fossilize terribly well uh, and, and still don't fossilize terribly well to this day because they're quite small creatures. And it's a case uh, of having more and more good fossils being unearthed. A lot of them are coming from places in China and, and new digs and such like where people are, are finding all these new fossils and then often revisiting old fossils of dinosaurs and knowing what to look for. Because once you've got some really, really good fossils, then you, you notice these sorts of patterns and such like and you suddenly revisit the old ones and you can actually say that what we thought we're just ignoring here are actually the imprint of feathers so it's been a case of having some really good marker fossils and then working back and looking across all these other species and many of them weren't probably like filament uh, sort of very sort of filamentous feathers they weren't or ornamental ones like peacocks but they were sort of a covering of down essentially which is 
probably why feathers evolved in the first place to sort of to keep these reptiles warm, basically. Uh, and again, which which ones had it is again open to question, but it's it's like a lot of small species did. It's just a good way of keeping them warm, basically. <laughs> Interesting. Okay, uh, let's let's go back to to the Amazon Amazonia as 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 a whole. Um, can you explain? ecologically like what what role like from the ecological perspective we have essentially like a half of the continent covered like i don't know if it's still half of the continent and we and we obviously get to that um and just as a side note uh, i was just i'm just still afraid that this podcast will end up being very uh, kind of negative and depressing but let's let's uh, for for now let's focus on from the ec- ecological global and global perspective, what is Amazon? How what what role it plays and and how it's laid out? Yeah, so so Amazon is this vast basin. Then, so seven million square kilometers. We discussed the fact that you know a lot of that is primary rainforest. It's the largest remaining extant of primary rainforest on the planet. So, I mean, it's incredibly important for a number uh, of things. One of which is the the carbon storage and all that timber. So that it makes this, you know, basically this massive sort of store uh, uh, of, uh, of global carbon. And so obviously as, as biologists uh, and, and sort of geoscientists are incredibly worried about the impact of, of the loss of that carbon, for instance. It's one of the most important repositories of terrestrial biodiversity on the planet. So in terms of species richness, it's pretty much unmatched by any other uh, terrestrial you know, biome. And you think about... Uh, the sort of the superlative figures of, you know, like a, over a thousand species of tree in, in, in sort of 60 hectares of Ecuadorian rainforest versus, you know, like a le- lot less than half of that for the whole of Europe, for instance. Uh, you, you know, millions of species of insects, think about birds, we're, we're getting close to sort of 2,000 species for the basin already. And that, you know, compares very, uh, I mean, it's the whole of North America is, is probably not not 900 or, or species or so so incredible incredible richness there incredible richness from a, a like a socio uh, biodiversity perspective you know there's 350 or so indigenous groups there still on contacted people living in living in amazonia uh incredibly important from a, a, a climate maintenance perspective uh so you know not just in terms of um, carbon storage, but in terms of precipitation cycling. So because Amazon is this huge sort of extent of rainforest, it generates its own almost global scale weather pattern. So it creates this these monsoon rains, which roll south into the southern cone of South America. So, you know, there wouldn't be these huge extensive agricultural areas in, in southern Brazil and Argentina and, and Uruguay and Paraguay without those Amazonian monsoon rains, something we can return to talk about uh, with Amazon forest loss and the implications of that, for instance, but uh, those also generates uh, sort of weather patterns which move north as well, and incredibly even probably important for North American weather. And it's one of those things of how you know sort of we live in this age of of increasingly sort of big data and a big data analysis, and we can suddenly now sort of understand the importance of these what we call like teleconnections between different regions. So we also now know that. Um, the deserts of, of North Africa are incredibly important for Amazonia because they produce these winds which blow all this sand, which basically fertilizes Amazonia with sort of uh, uh, nutrients and rare minerals, which otherwise it would be lacking, for instance. So it gets more and more incredible. You realize how the sort of the Earth system is so sort of closely knit. And when we start sort of chipping away at some of these pieces, then they can have, you know, potentially quite catastrophic results. So hence the sort of the um, the view that uh, the global public have of the importance and, and some stuff which isn't true for instance people talk about uh, Amazonia as being incredibly important in the world's lungs or whatever but that you know isn't true there is no sort of be no oxygen deficit from the loss of Amazonia but the impact on on carbon would be incredible and the impact on climate patterns would be incredible wow and you 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 mentioned uh, thing that I, I learned not that long ago that absolutely blew my mind that actually deserts in 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 africa sahara and all that they're kind of acting as a giant fertilizer for the want of the better description for for amazon forest for amazonia which is like whoa you you know like casual uh observers like well it's just like a big 
big desert, a lot of sand, like doesn't, ah, whatever, doesn't matter, nothing's there. And there's like, no, 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 you have actually the biggest ecological, you know, biodiversity and tank of, of all these species over there that is only because <laughs> you have this. this. And, and so tell me, like, how this is, at some point, the whole continent was covered with the similar type of uh, forest and biodiversity, or is it uh, like how how that developed? How did started? Do we know? Well, so yeah, we do we do know, and there's a very very long history of, of change which has brought us to where we are. I mean, think about you know hundreds of million years ago, you've got the, the breakup of the the supercontinent Gondwana land, uh, and that which was sort of formed with South America and Antarctica and in India and such like all broke apart. And then the, the sort of South Africa and, 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 uh, and South America drifted North and then separated. And, and then the big part, most of South America sort of drifted over to the West and eventually it, it basically collided with the, 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 the sort of the Nazca continental plate. And that led to the, the formation of the Andes, which were incredibly important in shaping Amazonia how it is now you know it ended up changing the drainage basins which formerly a lot of the rivers ran into the Pacific and then the Andes got in the way so all then the rivers now flow east so there was a complete change in the drainage and in in between that period in the Miocene there was this huge what we call the Pebas formation so this massive lake which formed there and there's some amazing fossils of like an incredible diversity of like crocodilians in, in prehistory there, you know, millions of years ago, there were these gigantic crocodiles and all these cool things there. And that all sort of dried up. But then there was also previous, uh, uh, when sea levels were higher historically, again, millions of years ago, there were these marine incursions. So sometimes the sea would come in, uh, and which is why to this day, we've got sort of freshwater uh, stingrays and, and the dolphins and these, see these freshwater crabs, which are, you know, thousands of miles from the sea there all these things evolved and probably lots of lots of other species of these sort of marine type things would have gone extinct but a few things have sort of hung on if you like and then there's the role of all the glaciations as well um so probably for several million years amazonia was pretty homogeneously rainforest but then the glaciations tipped that balance a bit and the cold times we saw an expansion of the the savannas which we have in the, in the Cerrado biome which is the sort of the east and southeast of Brazil, there's a huge area of savannas, which are, if anything, even more, much more threatened than Amazonia. And, and also not, like, incomparably, incomparably not as rich. I mean, incredible diversity of wildlife there, but a lot of that's gone under the plough, basically. Uh, but anyway, these sort of savannas uh, increased and decreased in Amazonia with those sort of cold and, and dry cycles, for instance. So there's always been quite a lot of dynamism. Uh, and then sort of from... Well, from at least 10,000 years ago, but possibly earlier, we had people arriving in, in, in uh, the Amazon basin, and they had probably quite significant impact, particularly in the south of the basin, in places like uh, the Moshos in, in Bolivia, for instance, so building earthworks and, and moving plants around and opening up clearings and doing some slash and burn and they all they had you know some quite sort of uh, advanced civilized societies there as well all of which was you know destroyed when there was you know the the continent was um colonized by europeans for instance so it's been a long history of change but i mean the change we're seeing at the moment is, it kind of exceeds all any of that sort of historical change in, in terms of, of rates and uh, and consequences i guess yeah so before we get to that uh, I, you, you, you sparked my interest with those savannas because this is again something that not people are not talking about, not hear about uh, that they're in danger. They're equally biodiversity rich. Like what? Like number one, I would like like you to tell us a little bit more about it. And number two, like why is it? Ha why is this like? A, is it like the savanna is not as sexy as the rainforest or? I think I think it is exactly that. I mean, people when people see a savanna, which you know, uh, and the savannas themselves are incredibly va variable. So in Brazil, they have these sort of campo pestides, what they call these rocky type savannas, and then you have campo limpos, which are the really open ones, and then you have like the tree sort of light wooded savannas. They all have different species, incredible diversity of plants, lots and lots of endemic species. So species only found there and with very small global ranges. But it's just not as dramatic, I guess, as, as the rainforest. And there is less carbon stored there. Uh, but there's still a huge amount uh, of biodiversity, which is, which is being, being lost. And 
I guess the, the global focus has always been on rain, rainforests and people just, you know, don't sort of, um, don't put the same weight and emphasis on, on sort of natural grassland systems, which is obviously a, a massive shame. And, and the British, that Brazilian government for a long time was sort of like, well, we'll try and save Amazonia, but the Cerrado, you know, that's, we've, that's going to go or whatever. And, uh, you know, it's, it's a, it's a grand shame as well. And, and, you know, there are very, lots of species which are sort of now critically endangered because of loss. And, and it's not all parts of the savanna which are equally threatened. It's really these sort of these uh, campo limpos or campo umidos, the humid campos, they call them, which are the most threatened because they have like, the best soil um, and the easiest to clear. Whereas at like, the rocky areas, well, they're no good for anyone. So they're kind of all right. But uh, some of these uh, campo limpos, they're, they're only basically now found in some uh, a few nature reserves which are in, increasingly fragmented and then vulnerable to to fires which which are a natural process in in savannas uh, not in amazonia we can talk about that afterwards um but when you if you've only got a nature reserve and the whole thing burns and then nothing can go anywhere essentially whereas in a normal system you have a fire and, and wildlife moves in and out of those areas so it's the problem this uh, lack of resilience that just having patchy nature reserves gives us basically yeah, same, same and, problem and, here and anywhere else. Yeah, and and I guess also for um, when you're clearing out savanna, this is less spectacular because you, yep. you you're just taking you know it's not about you have like this big thing you felling trees and all that and you're transforming the landscape. What's about yeah? Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's that's very very um, educational. Listen, so we talked about the the Amazon and, and a little bit of a history. Would you agree that the history is really like a history of destruction from the first first people? It's like a part of the process because it seems, you know, I remember since, again, since I was a kid and obviously even as a kid, I was very interested in, in nature and all, and all, all, all things. I, I, I don't even know how I ended up working in, in computer industry. But anyway, uh, it was always even very old uh films on National Geographic or, or Attenborough films. It was like this, this big forest, Amazon, yada, 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 biodiversity. But we slash and burn and cut and like, and, you know, we are like fast forward 30 years, 40 years, like yeah, this, nothing changed. This is only accelerating, if anything, right? So how long it, I don't know, be, I mean, any comments? Is, is this really from the first people we just turn to? Yeah, so fans? there's certainly been change as soon as people arrived. Uh, for instance, you know, the, the, the Clovis culture, which is the, the culture that first sort of colonized the Americas. Or I say that first because, it's, it, again, it's, there's increasing evidence that actually the Clovis might not have been the first people to have colonized South America, but it's still controversial. And I'm, I'm not an archaeologist to talk about that with a um, high degree of precision. Um, but, yeah, we do know that certainly people were well entrenched uh, in South America by at least 10,000 years. And around that time, we lose essentially this spectacular megafauna, which is the same loss of megafauna which we see throughout the world, basically. You know, when people left Africa, they'd refine their skills at, at hunting large mammals. Uh, in Africa, people co-evolved with those large mammals, so at least the, the large mammals then got to sort of be wary about people and, and learnt to sort of to develop their own countermeasures. But as soon as people escaped from Africa, colonised other areas, they met these naive faunas, uh, and <laughs> that in essentially that in the Americas was completely naive. And if you imagine you're a mastodon or whatever, and you see a, a small diurnal primate that weighs you know, a tiny fraction of your body mass, you're just going to look up and then look down and start munching again. It wouldn't have been prepared for, for what came at you with spears and everything else. So, you know, we quickly essentially wiped out uh, the megafauna in, in the new world, including uh, in, in South America. There's some controversy over like how much the sort of megafauna may have used the Amazon basin. Uh, one problem is that fossils are quite rare in Amazonia. You tend to find them in these sort of rockier areas uh, around the basin rather than in it. It's just not really the conditions for fossil formation. So we don't really know whether many of these big things would have been particularly common in Amazonia or if they were just restricted, for instance, to the the sort of savanna enclaves within Amazonia. Uh, so that's something which is still a debate uh, among scientists is ongoing. But anyway, we, we ended up causing the extinction of all of these basically large mammals uh, throughout the Americas and including the Amaz in Amazonia. Amazing to this day that people still discover uh, what they call in Brazil the paleotocas, these paleo burrows, like massive burrows of some of these things like glyptodon, this 
sort of huge armadillo relative, like the size of a mini, essentially, uh, and, and still finding, you know, almost, you know, mummified remains of ground sloths. And there was some small ground sloths, which definitely occurred in Amazonia, for instance. But anyway, the, so the people arriving obviously overhunted some of these big animals, um, but they at least did find a balance after that. Uh, and the area still remained uh, largely forested. Um, there was some areas which were deforested, but sort of nothing on the scale uh, of, of what subsequently happened. So uh, we can at least say that the, that the indigenous people there were much better stu uh, stewards than the people that arrived after that, for the European colonists. And then Amazon deforestation didn't really get going for quite a long time. You know, there was there was um, a lot of usage of Amazonia, and Amazonia was almost more valued standing at the time because of the rubber the, the rubber trade, which you might be aware of. Ah, yes. Um, which is an interesting story in itself because um, uh, there was this huge demand uh, for, for rubber. Uh, and then once like vulcanization was, people worked out to do vulcanization to use that rubber properly, then there was this uh, essentially slave labor of the seringueros, the, the rubber tappers there. Uh, and this went on for you know a long time until um, Henry Wickham, uh, a Brit, essentially stole. He was like the first bio pirate. Essentially, stole rubber seeds and then took them out to the British colonies, uh, Ceylon and, and Malay, and ended up establishing rubber plantations there, which essentially collapsed the the rubber industry uh, in Brazil, for instance. And it's why to this day that sort of Brazilians are very aware of, sort of the, the effects of this. Uh, biopiracy and have got quite strong laws against that basically oh. and there are still rubber tappers out there but it's you know it's worth nothing like the money it was now and it caused this huge but where i lived in belain was this boom town you know and that's why the, the big the, there were opera houses in belain and in manaus as well and the huge amounts of money and at the same time there was incredible amounts of animal skins exported from amazonia as well so there was quite a lot of hunting pressure on all sorts of species at the time as well and you know and hundreds of thousands of skins coming out of the basin around that time too but sort of deforestation didn't really get going until sort of 60s and 70s that really sort of started making a lot of headway and that was largely driven by the sort of um the, the then uh, military uh, brazilian sort of military dictatorships thinking strategically and thinking well you know if we don't occupy this land then maybe the americans will come in or whatever and as far oh, as they really <laughs> yeah, as far as they were concerned the sort of motto was entrega para now entrega sort of use it or lose it uh, so they thought, right, we've got to get people into here and occupying this space because, um, you know, it, oh. other people might take it over, essentially. And then there was sort of successive policies to, to incentivize migration into Amazonia, huge uh, road building schemes, uh, which led to, you know, the sort of the first sort of push to, of deforestation. And then eventually, well, that sort of reached a peak in, in, in 2004, I guess, deforestation rates peaked. Um, 27,000 kilometers squared, I think, 2004. And that dropped uh, all the way. Incidentally, when I started my PhD, but I don't think I can take all the credit for the fact that it then dropped to 4,000 in, in 2012. Uh, and then subsequently, it's gone up again to about, you know, about 10,000 kilometers in 2019 and, and a bit less last year. And again, how, why did it go down? Well, uh, the sort of a, uh, sort of, I guess the world woke up to a certain degree about these problems put some pressure on Brazilian government. So the then sort of left-wing government and the, and the Brazilian Workers' Party at the time, they had a series of command and control policies aimed at, at stopping deforestation. So monitoring via satellite, uh, more investment in the sort of Brazilian environmental police. But there are also uh, what we call sort of macroeconomic drivers at play too. So the price of soy had gone up, which incentivized deforestation. Then it started coming down again. So that disincentivizes. Right. And then there were then moratoria, uh, uh, on on soy and cattle, so so that you couldn't sell uh, cows, uh, you know, uh, beef coming from recently deforested last sand, and the same for soybeans. So these are the uh, incentives, basically, to to stop deforestation. And again, also campaigns by sort of uh, NGOs and and yeah, lots of different factors that conspired. And then, sort of post 2012, well, we had a, essentially a, a coup d'état in Brazil and, and Dilma was ousted on, on various charges, which proved to be, you know, sort of uh, of no significance. And we swapped, you know, one government, which certainly was corrupt to an extent for one which is even more corrupt and incredibly sort of anti-environmental since then. And, uh, and the current president has been giving all these signals about our NGOs out, uh, Amazonia, we've, you know, it's ours for the taking, we've got to get rid of it. And 
<laughs> and just rubbishing everything basically and that's why we've just seen this sort of undoing of, of all that progress and we sort of wrote papers back in the start of the last decade about you know how it was going so well and brazil was you know on top of all this and things were looking quite rosy even so it's sort of quite distressing to see how things have, have unwound quite quickly since then well that's that's interesting i didn't know that there was like a uh, a, a period of optimism even so that so that's, that, yeah. that's in itself optimistic that we had this this little um listen alex before we get to that i just want to i just want to wind us back a little bit and ask you a question that is maybe a little bit of on, on tangent but obviously you're 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 very uh on point on the latest research because you mentioned uh that the dominant theory of clove clovis first is kind of there are some cracks on it, and now we have more and more evidence that maybe that Clovis first was really uh, kind of counterproductive uh, to some other research because it, it, you know I, I am I am not scientist obviously, but I'm quite often very frustrated with the scientific process which which is in those grooves and and essentially anyone any young scientist who tries to go out of the groove gets smashed and and then more and more and more you know at some point you need you need to work a lot on the evidence to start changing the main mainstream which you can argue is is part of the also of the uh power of the scientific process that is not changing on the whim of oh someone finds something else so i have a like where where you where you sit right now how how does it look with the theory of the younger dryas impact that because i see more and more people talking like well maybe that's not humans who kill all that megafauna because we have this major cl major climate change and we have this this uh, energy paradox that there was not you probably know that better than than, than I, but I, I was just, just going to try to do as good as job as I can. That there was not enough energy on the planet to melt all those all the uh, glaciers, so it has to be energy come somewhere else. And then the date where it happened around twelve thousand uh, twelve thousand years ago mm. is kind of uh, matches with the cycle where the Earth is passing the the. Uh, you know, belt of the asteroids or is like most likely being hit by some extraterrestrial. So there's like, yeah, you know, maybe it's not or our fault, all the mammoths and all the mastodons. Maybe there was like a major uh, climate event, major catastrophic event like the one with dinosaurs. And again, I'm old enough to remember that the, uh, when, when I start, when I was, you know, big enough to actually uh, retain some of that information, the people were wondering, like, what happened to dinosaurs? Or maybe they were too big. Maybe they were like an evolutionary dead end. Maybe it was a volcano and the asteroids didn't come up. And then slowly started going like, ah, someone somewhere told that maybe it was an asteroid, maybe something. And now we've, again, fast forward 30 years and like, okay, asteroid killed dinosaurs. That's the thing, right? So what's your comments and observation on this younger Dryas impact? Is it is it gaining traction or is it like still on the fringe um so in terms of what was the major driver of the loss of megafauna globe globally there's still a lot of scientific debate and there's still potentially a role for climate change but there's also a role for the loss of megafauna driving climate change too so there's a potential synergism between those two things so increasingly we we understand that uh, the loss of, of of, of megafauna in the whole Arctic, uh, so in the northern sort of latitudes of, of North America and Eurasia, may have essentially ushered in this boreal forest wilderness we take it as being a natural system today. And in fact, there was a lot more of sort of savanna grassland there, which was kept open by mammoths and such like. So when we lost those, those ecosystem engineers, those big creatures, we saw a change in, 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 in vegetation, which ushered in a change in climate. There's a similar reason to believe that um, historical changes in Australia were the result of the loss of the megafauna there as well. So once we'd lost the megafauna, we may have seen more woodland, also more buildup, more dry forest, also more buildup potentially of, of frass and leaf litter, which would have favoured fires, which people had started using at the time anyway. So it may be that, you know, that the 
uh, so it's kind of the rewilding paradigm, isn't it, in a way? But it's this idea of this top-down control by very large animals can can shape global climates. And the reason why we see a change uh, in in climate company with their loss is because they're actually partly responsible for it. I don't doubt also that you know the populations of these animals would be at their weakest and their lowest at, at, at the times of the late glacial maximum because they'll be concentrated in these refugial reason, re, uh, re, uh, regions. So then you've got a, a weakened population, which is far more easily to be impacted by this new super predator, which which was which is us essentially. I find it really difficult to think that climate can possibly be the sole driver because we, you know, the, the megafauna survives successive glaciations. You know, there's millions, several million years of worth of, of glaciations happening, and and every or every time they sort of got through, if you know what I mean. You know, some species went extinct, just like they always do, but the big change came with the advent of people and that was staggered across the globe, right? You think about islands, islands were the last places where, where people reached. I mean, you know, New Zealand was occupied by giant birds 400 years ago, you know, and we wiped them out in like, or whatever many it was, 10, 12 species in like a hundred years, we were so efficient. Or think about Cyprus, you know, a thousand years ago had pygmy elephants and pygmy hippos until people arrived there. And, uh, and then like Wrangell Island was the last place that retained the mammoths because people didn't arrive there till late. So it is staggered in that way. And the earliest extinctions of some lineages of, of giant antelopes are in Africa like 100,000 years ago. So it seemed that, that the megafauna extinction isn't concomitant. It happened at different places at different times. There was climate change associated with it, but that's my take. And I could be proved wrong. And like you said, uh, with the, the, the pre-Clovis information, it's it's such a big change and, and some people have built their entire careers around it. Well, they'll, they'll, they'll try and push back on it until that evidence becomes overwhelming. At the moment, it's it's very strong and circumstantial, but there's still problems with dating. There are problems with layers and sediments. And again, I'm not the best person to talk about uh, the, the issues surrounding. Eventually, it, it will become as cultures as well would have just left fewer remains. So it becomes more difficult. And the pre Clovis culture shed its remains ever because of those stone hand axes and such like, and they're much easier to find. But, you know, you're looking at much um, more tenuous sort of evidence of fire pits and such like from, from older civilizations, which didn't have those material possessions, which, you know, essentially we can find millennia afterwards. Right. Uh, right. And, and on, on dinosaurs, I guess, as well. Well, we've all, you know, all these, these ideas do change, but certainly no one could have viewed dinosaurs as being the sort of relic lineage. I mean, uh, I was interesting. I saw there was uh, an article. Uh, I, I didn't even open up the article. I saw on Twitter the other day, but I saw people were, were, were laying into the, 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 the paleo illustration, which to illustrate the end of the dinosaurs, there was like a, a stegosaurus and something else. And the stegosaurus lived like 250 million years ago. And that's, you know, a lot longer before the, the Tyrannosaur they had there than it is from then to the present day. I mean, dinosaurs ruled the world for an inordinate amount of time. And us mammals are only ruling the world for like a, a third of the amount of time, you know, since the dinosaurs have been going. So, you know, yeah. and again, arguably, they're all, they're all still here in this sort of 11,000 species of them. They're just mostly quite small. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's, and, I, and I'm happy that you're kind of confirmed that you, that you actually said that there's, a lot of people are building their careers or certain things, and then they they will push back. And then young scientists, then up and coming, they're not. They are also kind of have like a, a self preservation instinct. They're not. They're not gonna go against the grain. They will kind of. Well, no, it's not. It's not a case of going against the grain because if you can convince reviewers and you can convince top journals to publish that, then that's. I mean, that's that's how science is done. And and throwing out. Binning, if you can bin, if you can apt, well, if you can absolutely prove uh, pre-Clovis in, 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 and that some of these dates of uh, maybe as long as 22,000 years ago in Brazil, if you can prove that's true, uh, um, and there are papers coming out in really good journals, then then as a scientist, you've made it. So there's there's always, I mean, scientists don't like agreeing with each other. We fight continuously, and and I'm in all sorts of all these sort of camps, and I'm in a I've been published papers where we're sort of arguing with anthropologists about the relative role of that people had in, in, in shaping Amazonia, for instance, and there's all these to and force and back with new evidence. And, and and scientists don't settle into consensus as easy, certainly. It's just that the the evidence isn't good enough yet um, to definitely say that's the case. So that it may well prove to be, you know, even within a few years, perhaps. 
Yeah. And like you said, there's usually a multitude of factors that are causing some, some big changes and, and it's, it's never, never that easy. Okay. Uh, before, we, before we get into the uh, current situation uh, and, and how it looks like, why it is happening, I have a question more of a, like you've been in Amazonia, obviously, many times for a long time. How, and I understand that the question might be a little bit, you know, uh, not correct because there's so many different, there's no one Amazonia, there's like different forests, different different ecosystems. But I, maybe I, t- I tell, tell you and, and our viewers like where I'm coming from. Initially, when I heard about Amazonia, Amazon forest, it was like, oh, this fantastic place, all these birds and animals and forests and trees and all that. I just want to go there. And then a number of years later, it slowly transformed into like, well, man, this is hell. This is like hot, humid, uh, all sorts of insects try to bite you or lay eggs in you. And you, you better not go there because, you know, bats going to be pissing on you and all this stuff. How does it, how does it look like on the ground in, in Amazonia? Well, it's, it's, it can be unpleasant. It can be extremely hot. You know, I've had a dengue fever and I've had you think of things wow. like laying, laying eggs and you've had tungiasis, which is this tiny little flea which kind of buries into you, your feet and your legs. So I've had that, which is a bit itchy and such like, and bacillic dysentery and, and various other problems. I've, I've managed to never got a bot fly, which is very surprising given that, I mean, I've had, I've had an MSc student which, who worked with me when I was doing my PhD, Simon Mahood, and he, he, got, he got like a couple of bot flies and even grew one in his, in his back. And there's a video on YouTube that's been viewed of mine, it's been viewed a quarter of a million times of, of the extract, us extracting this massive bot fly out of his back, for instance, um, and leishmaniasis and everything else. But it's not, it's not that co- common to get those prob- to get those issues. And bullet ants, yeah, you, is there all the way, all the one like a bullet ants? Is that yeah, that bullet ants. I've never also never been bitten by a bullet ant, which is supposed to be a rite of passage of uh, Amazonian ecologists. And I've had, <laughs> I even had the same the same um, Simon Mahood we mentioned earlier. He want, took one off me with off, took one off my neck with a machete, which is probably more dangerous than a bullet ant. <laughs> Um, yeah, they're horrend- horrendous to get bitten by one of those. But I mean, again, I've managed to, to get away without that happening. I, I've never been bitten by a snake there, but all sorts of run-ins with meeting sort of bushmasters and, and trails in the middle of the night. And when we were as part of this big project, we did this big sort of ecosystem accounting exercise. We spent a year in the field and were, you know, sort of counting birds and measuring trees. We had two 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 snake bites in the project in in, in that time, for instance. Um, uh, was, one, it, one was it dangerous? Were there like a, well, like a was super it, venomous? Was, it was a very, very dangerous snake, uh, Bothropsis tineata, I think it's striped necked uh, pit viper, I think his English name. And the guy was sort of um, had a DBH tape, a diameter breast height tape, and was sort of measuring that round a tree and got a, a wet slap in the face from this arboreal viper. Um, but we'd gone to hospital and he got the antivenom and he survived. And in fact, we always wore uh, snake gaiters in the field there as well. Uh, and we had a couple of bounce offs as well of, of people getting hit on the gators and, and, and being fine. Are they like normally over the shoes? Like is, is they, these snake gators, or are they special in any way? Yeah, they go, they go right up to your knee, basically. Um, uh, and so then, therefore, they're made of, uh, well, the ones I used to have some Kevlar ones, uh, some of the, the States, but the ones I use out there were just sort of strong leather with a, some like reinforced plastic or something and then they're, they're good enough for most stuff you're really unlucky if it were you get a, a big bush master and that'll bite you in the chest because the second world's la- well, second largest poison snake in the world but to one of bush masters are quite docile and it's it's more the little fertilances which are more of a problem but again i mean it, the, the, what kills traffic biologists though is like traffic accidents and, and stuff like that which <laughs> is far course. more dangerous than than the snakes and 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 brazil is still kind of wild west as well and we had there were um, it's still quite a dangerous place to, to work in in many areas, especially in the frontier when if people think you're the environmental police or think you're Greenpeace or whatever. And uh, But because we were sort of affiliated with Embrapa, the sort of Brazilian, uh, sort of, uh, in, sort of equivalent to the sort of Brazilian sort of agricultural ministry researchers, basically, that was sort of more accepted, but driving around in a sort of white car, you know, it's often quite quite dangerous. When, when Greenpeace is out there, they drive, they're using sort of armoured... Um, Whoa! Uh, armored cars, not well, armored car, but you know, reinforced um, blindada. They say in Brazil, the, the the windshields and such like. So it, yeah, it's dangerous and very high rates of murder of envi- environmentalists. And so those are the things that sort of really, really worry us more than um, 
than than snake bites and yeah i re- i i i you know i worked with a guy who worked from brazil in, in uh, at and during one of the, our calls he said like well my my uh, internet connection is dropping because the bullets are hitting the the pole in the side because there's some you know some gangs explaining things to themselves and the bullets are causing like whoa dude where are you i was like oh yeah i'm just living here it's like that i was like for us we're like whoa man yeah. i can <laughs> just, if we if we talk a bit later on i can give you an interesting example about so one of the problems essentially is is land land tenure and, and disputes so i mean it was a time when i was doing my phd when i sort of rolled up to the petrol station and the, the owner of the uh, the petrol station was lying dead on the on the forecourt there, and he'd been shot by someone that worked in the bank over a land tenure dispute. Whoa! So that's, you know, one crazy. of the big issues, and, and incredibly, and again, this is more of sort of solutions. But um, some of the big NGOs, like the Nature Conservancy, have essentially been sort of stepping into the shoes of the government because they've been trying to get people uh, land tenure. Because you know you can't control deforestation until you understand who owns what, uh, and so they've been that's been the goal has been making sure everyone's got land tenure because then you can be held accountable for what happens there and hopefully you don't also get shot by your neighbor. So sometimes well, it's quite simple things, which are actually what we need to solve these problems. Yeah. So before we get into that, just one, one last thing. I know that I, I realize I say, before we get into that, before uh, uh, there's so many interesting things that we could probably speak for an hours and hours. When we, when you were talking about the uh, diseases and being bitten by I mean, there are people living there. And like I said, indigenous people who probably don't have access to, to anti-venom and, and any of that. Is this list just like an attrition rate is high in those people or are they adopted to these conditions way better than we are? And this is a matter of, you know, like a white guy going where it doesn't supposed to be. Yeah, people get much, much better at recognizing those threats in the forest. I mean, so often we're working with lo- local guides who aren't indigenous, but they're kind of quasi in- indigenous. And, and they'll, they will they t- often tend to be the people that, that spot the snakes. When I'm out on my own, I tend to spot the snakes when I'm about to step on them rather than noticing them when they're seven meters ahead of me and, and, and out of the danger and, and noticing the wasps nests hanging from the underside of foliage and, and all these sort of problems and being sort of much better at, at, at spotting them. But equally, you know, I've worked in some remote areas and, and the number of people you can see who've lost a leg from, from snake bite is, is also quite high. So these, these are not sort of, um, uh, they are, they are genuine sort of risks uh, uh, for people living out there, certainly, but they certainly people are sort of much better trained at identifying and those risks, basically. Gotcha. There are so some not- areas which uh, the, the, the sort of the biomass of, of biting insects are so high that not even indigenous people um, lived in them, essentially. And I, I've worked in visited places in the Western Amazon, which have been, you sort of have one layer of mosquitoes in your arm and a second layer sort of sitting on top of that layer. Uh, so it's and that varies so much depending whether you're in like a white water or a black water area of Amazonia. Um, so there's a huge amount of variation in, in how sort of pleasant the conditions can be there. And people would tend to settle in the sort of black water areas for these sort of more oligotrophic areas, which have far fewer sort of biting insects, basically, because of presumably because all the tannins in the water or whatever. And this is all related to the underlying geology. So um, Broadly speaking, in Amazonia, you have the sort of white water rivers which come down from the Andes. Uh, so they're coming very sediment, they've got high sediment load, very, very fertile. And then they're all sort of black water rivers which come down from either the Brazilian shield in the south or the Guyana shield in the north, coming from really weathered, like pre Cambrian ancient rocks. Uh, and there is a much, far less fertile. Uh, and the rivers running through these areas are sort of leached of. Uh, of any mineral content and this has big implications for the sort of fertility of the forest and species composition but also just the amount of like uh mosquitoes that are biting you but again it varies a lot and it's just just this idea that the area isn't homogenous and there are these different sort of white and dark water areas basically and which has implications for patterns of human historic human settlement and uh, and biogeographic patterns for which species are where and such like and we're really in many ways we're only really getting a good handle on that now and people are even finding new species which are sort of cryptically similar to one another and some are in black water areas and some are in white water areas and so you know really really important basically right would you would you say for a enthusiast of uh, wildlife and nature or, or bird enthusiasts or, or fishing enthusiasts, would you say that 
this is a great place to go for your bucket list holidays and and see you know even see it while it's there because that's you know not not sure what future holds or whether you said like well you know you're actually probably better off to go somewhere else don't don't go there because of all the dangers that we describe which are human made and not only <laughs> human made yeah i i wouldn't i wouldn't I wouldn't disincentivize anyone to go because of the dangers. I mean, it's quite an expensive place to go to. And there's an entire broader question, which you certainly won't get into do the bay about sort of traveling, obviously vast distances to go on holidays and such like, but from the perspective of seeing amazing wildlife and certainly fishing, you mentioned as well, then, you know, there's some incredible fish there and lots of lodges as well. And as long as that's catch and release, then that's no, no qualms uh, uh, on my behalf. And there's another way of sort of valuing, uh, valuing the forest as it is, essentially. So I think that's extremely important. It can be quite frustrating, Amazonia, for for eco tourists because you know it's quite hard to see wildlife there. You know, you're walking through the forest and you you hear lots of birds, but you often don't see them very well. For instance, because a lot of them are up in the canopy and they're all small and green. And which is why a lot of people when they travel to Brazil, they go to like the Pantanal, which is open savanna wetland habitat, and you can relatively easily see jaguars and uh, and tapirs and that sort of stuff. Whereas seeing wildlife in Amazonia is quite difficult and it's even quite difficult for the locals. So we just had a paper out looking at a connection with nature amongst Amazonian um, uh, smallholders. So that was uh, led by uh, uh, a student of mine, um, Cassia Mikulczak. Uh, and she essentially found that um, essentially Amazonian rural farmers were very, had very little knowledge of, of forest birds they sort of knew the names of the non-forest species that, that occurred in the fields, but had no idea of the forest species. And and almost there's potentially a risk of them not valuing the forest because they, they don't see any birds when they go in there. They sort of hear some twittering or whatever. And then you sort of got the really obvious things to see in the fields and they have no understanding of the, the forest wildlife. So it is genuinely quite hard to see stuff, basically. But I wouldn't say that don't go because of that, because there are lodges where you can certainly see things. And just to be there and to experience it is, is pretty phenomenal. And especially areas which have canopy towers, it's much easier to see the birds, for instance, kind of like the one in the image that I guess you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's good. That's a good call out. Okay, so let's talk about like how this situation, this messy, arguably, situation looks like right now. Uh, and you already... You, you already touched on that, that uh, uh, ownership of the land, land use is not uh, not, not the clear cut. It's not uh, uh, decided. The government, which is uh, kind of uh, tries to extract as much as, as possible. Uh, that doesn't, that doesn't, that doesn't, <laughs> that doesn't look good, no matter how you, how you cut it. Um, yeah. So, so how, how bad is it is the question to some extent yeah so the we've seen an increase in deforestation rates uh since 2012 basically so in 2012 it reached its lowest which is 4000 kilometers squared basically which is still you know a lot of forest but obviously massively down from you know 27000 kilometers squared it was at the time it was going we, we were all sort of thinking well can we get to deforestation zero essentially and and is deforestation zero a possibility? Well, there's no reason why not, because the problem with Amazonia is there's a huge areas where the forest has been cut down and there's nothing ecologically productive happening there. And this so, is because- this, so this is so sorry. So this is this is a quick question. Like when we talk about deforestation, is it like there is no forest regenerating anywhere? Yeah. Is that is that correct? So there's, so it's not like we lost 4000 square kilometers, but there's like 8000 or 500, you know, grew back in is that's not happening we only no, go in one, one direction there's some of that happening too oh okay. so, what, so what you need to know essentially is is it's really complex what is happening in terms of transitions between land uses so a couple of terms uh, to bear in mind here so what i'm going to refer to as primary rainforest is the original sort of uh or potentially undisturbed rainforest so Without, without any human impacts, it's primary, undisturbed primary rainforest. That rainforest can be disturbed by people by selective logging. So not clear cutting, but people go in, remove some commercially valuable tree, individuals of trees, then remove those, which changes the forest, but it's not cutting it down, right? 
And then we have fires, and we can go on to talk a lot about fires because they're, they're a huge issue, but that's another agent of disturbance which reduces biodiversity, but there's still a forest there. And then we have clear cutting. So a clear cutting is basically to change the land use from forest to something else. Now, the predominant uh, land use change is from this primary forest to cattle pasture. So cattle pasture has been the biggest driver of forest loss. And people put cows on there because it's cheap uh, and it immediately stamps your sort of ownership on that land. You know, you can have a huge, huge ranch and you have to uh, employ a couple of cowboys and you can get loads of money off that whilst often waiting for that land to accrue value. So you're speculating by owning that land, that land will go up in value. In many cases, the sort of the soybean people have arrived and bought that land and you've made a very tidy profit from having acquired that land, cleared it. You have some money will have come in from the commercial, commercially valuable tree species. You know, you've paid a couple of cowboys uh, an absolute minimum wage, exported a load of sort of uh, cheap, uh, very tasty or organic beef at the expense of uh, a primary rainforest. And then you often move on then to deforest some more. Uh, because you've sold that plot to the, the the people moving in. In some areas, people have cut down the forest and then gone bust. And and what has come back is what we call secondary forest. And there is there are quite large areas of secondary forest in Amazonia that don't have the same biodiversity value um, as primary forest, but they will eventually, after a few hundred years, acquire it again. But in many areas, the secondary forest is then cut down again, and it goes back into agriculture, for instance, or the cattle pasture becomes oil palm, or, or it becomes soy or rice or coffee or something else. So we have all these transitions basically between different land uses. And this varies by region. Some regions are, are, are mostly colonized by uh, smallholders. So we get this uh, like fishbone deforestation. So you get a road and then tiny little uh, plots either side of the road. In some areas, no, it's like gigantic ranches, often with some quite large remaining areas of forest attached to it. Uh, and the key to this is why we have these different patterns is because Brazil has some quite visionary legislation tied up with what we call the Brazilian Forestry Code, the Ecological Florestal. Uh, and when we can see, I can say all sorts of bad things about Brazilian environmental governance, but the laws that they have are fundamentally amazing compared with the laws we have, for instance, in the United Kingdom. So wow. in Brazil landowners are required to leave a certain percentage of their property as uh, the original regional forest cover. And that varies. It can be up to 80% of a, a rural property in Amazonia is supposed to be um, rainforest, essentially, in areas which are called consolidated areas. So close to the frontier, that comes down to like 50%. If you're in different Amaz Brazilian biomes, like in the Atlantic forest, it's like 20% in the Sahado, it's like five or 10 or something, a lot less, basically. Again, that that all the Sahado not being valued as much. But there is this legislation there which stipulates that people must preserve uh, habitat on their rural properties. And not only just preserve a chunk of habitat, they're also required to leave uh, habitat alongside rivers. And the amount of river, the sort of the buffer width that people have to protect depends on the width of the river. So, but you, it's like a minimum, like 10 meters or something. Uh, and that can go up to like 50 meters or more for a large river. So that means you've got like a, a hundred meter wide corridor inside of a river. And so that protects your water courses from silting up. It, it means you've got connectivity at the landscape scale. So animals and plants can not, not only live in those corridors, but also move between forest patches along those corridors. People are required not to deforest on, on steep slopes. Uh, protect uh, the sources of, of water bodies as well. So we've got all these laws. And I think about the UK, well, we've just got, we've got nothing, you know, to be honest. And again, because we've got far, uh, the history of environmental governance is, is proportionally far younger by the amount of change. And the Brazilians decided to have these laws and, and, and rates of compliance are very variable. But that what's happening at the moment, or what was happening quite well, is people were being required to reforest where they hadn't done enough. Or in some areas, uh, if you had a farmer who has more forest than, than, than he needs to have, for instance, or she needs to have, that then another farm who's in deficit could be renting out that patch of forest to another one. So 
there's there are all these mechanisms to 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 try and build a sustainable Amazon, and we have these the sort of great laws associated with that. But that all depends on the signals coming down from governments and and from the latest Brazilian administration. It's been like you know, well, we're not going to pursue any of these things. Go out and do what you want. And the sort of predatory loggers and land speculators and farmers have taken that sort of. Uh, taken that message to heart, and indeed, in the in the 2019 fires, which were not particularly even worse than last year's fires, but obviously last year with a global pandemic and the eyes of the world were focused on you know problems much closer to home. Um, but you know, when that, all that sort of kicked off in early August, there was a coordinated effort by landowners in the Nova Progresso region of the state of Pará. Uh, that all basically set fires at about the same time to send a signal to Bolsonaro that they were, quote, ready to go to work, essentially. <laughs> uh, and there was no pushback against that. Wow. Uh, it's probably worth uh, mentioning what the fires are as well, I guess. Maybe yes, you yes, go question. ahead. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So that's also, like, uh, super important because it's not, I mean... There was a lot of fake news about Amazonian fires. Uh, I mean, I saw all sorts of crazy pictures of, of boreal fires and these fire flames licking the treetops and such like. But um, that doesn't happen. So a fire in an Amazonian forest only burns basically almost along the ground. It doesn't look like much at all, a fire inside the forest. But the problem is that even though that fire is just burning through the leaf litter, burning quite slowly, it still can kill like 50% of the trees. Because unlike, say, in, in the in the Sahado, in the savanna, or indeed in the boreal forests that we see being on fire, like rainforest trees have no adaptation to fire. Uh -huh. uh, and the reason they're only catching on fire uh, is because of degradation. So when people damage those forests by removing large trees, it alters the forest microclimate, which dries out. Uh, and that desiccation means that the forests are more likely to catch fire. And also that when you've, especially if you're doing very predatory logging, pra predatory logging practices without sort of best practice, without like cutting the vines that, that bind the trees together, you get all this dead wood, which basically acts as kindling. And then we've had, because of climate change, we've had these really strong El Nino events. So in 2010, in 2015, and most of the fires have been associated with these strong in the El Nino events. That's what we call most of the forest fires. However, a lot of the fires in 2019 and 2020 weren't like forest fires like that. They were what we call deforestation fires. So what had happened to cut down the trees during the wet season, people were there with the chainsaws, removing the valuable tree species, uh, and then knocking over the rest, you know, sometimes they'll use bulldozers with a big chain and, and move through the forest if they can, knock it all over. But you can't put a light to that. That's not going to burn. It's wet. So that forest lies on the ground for several months. The dry season arise, rises, gets drier and drier and drier, and then they put a match to it come August and September. And those were the big fires we were seeing because it was an, a massive increase in deforestation and people were burning that forest, those, those forests. And sometimes it was, uh, you know, forests have been cut over even a year previously were being burnt. It just, it takes a long time until, uh, you know, you need a good dry summer basically to, to, to burn that stuff. And then there's a third type of fire, which, which fires also used, um, well, it's used by both smallholders to, to clear patches of secondary forest. So that happens. So we p talk about slash and burn, which is a method of sort of you, burn, you, you, you knock over a small patch of forest and you're planting that off with your bit, planting that up with your beans and your manioc or whatever, and you use it for a few years and then you let it go fallow. So you get this secondary forest starts growing up, then you knock it down again and start again. And people will burn those plots recurrently, basically, and the ash water fertilizes the soil, etc. But those sort of fires and agriculture are also used by the cattle ranchers to basically clean, if you like, their pastures. So ba what basically you see is a mix of these three types of fires, sort of pasture fires, deforestation fires, which are the, basically the remnants of the forest being torched, and then the fires which creep slowly through the forest. And they're interconnected, right? Because a deforestation fire might escape into the surrounding forest and then burn through it, especially if those forests have been had their sort of integrity weakened by selective logging or if they've been burnt before. And the more a forest has been burnt, the more its ecological community changes and the more also it becomes more likely to burn again, which is why the sort of damage gets worse and worse every time it happens. And the, 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 the terrible thing about these 
uh, forest fires. It's like no one wants the forest to burn, right? I mean, selective logging uh, is a method of extracting uh, resources and value from Amazonian forests. Uh, and I'm, as a conservation biologist, I'm not against uh, selective logging. The, the thing is, it's got to be done to best practice standards. But at the moment, like almost all logging, which happens in Amazonia, is predatory and illegal, basically. <laughs> and people go in and, ex and, and extract the maximum of value without all the detailed management plans, do it illegally. They can't sell that timber for as much money as they could get for it. And they can't sell it to, to international markets, most of it because it's illegal, although some of it gets through because they forge documents and such like, and people let the timber through. But essentially, we're missing a huge opportunity to make a lot more money out of Amazonia by, by managing those forests on long, very long logging return times, having some core areas which are never touched. But at the moment, without any government intervention, it's just all illegal, which means you can't do it legally because you can't compete against the illegals. So that really kills anyone's attempt to do logging in a sustainable manner. But for me, that's got to be one of the biggest things is, is, is you know, having low impact logging in Amazonia. And it, it, it's difficult to do well because, like we mentioned earlier on, is this incredible diversity of tree species. And they're very hard to tell apart. And, and some of these tree species are incredibly, incredibly rare. And then, you know, you, you've got to even know whether the tree's male or female. And you can particularly almost like wipe out the chances of a tree uh, going extinct in an area but just by removing a few of them if you don't know what you're doing properly as well. So it's incredibly hard to manage, basically. But it's not impossible. And I think we have to bear that in mind and uh, and help those people that are trying to do it well. And, and the difference between a forest which has been sort of logged to best practice versus one that's been uh, logged, and I mean logged, but, you know, sort of timber management, it is incredibly different because these big emergent trees, they're interconnected, this web of connectivity of surrounding trees by all these vines. You know, one of those big ones goes down, it, it can pull like 10 of the trees with it. And they're of no value commercially, but they're on the ground and, and then you've just done all that damage. So, and it takes money to go out and with, a, with, a, with you know, climb those trees, cut all those vines, you know, make sure you do it properly, basically. And, and the cost of that becomes prohibitory if, if the cowboys go in and just remove whatever they like, however they like, uh, and it just kills, it kills viable log logging operations, basically. Yeah, that, that sounds exactly like when you were saying, like my question was, which I know the answer now is like, so they just basically go in wherever they want, piece of land they don't necessarily have to own that land they just gonna go oh boys let's do this here yeah, it's often could be stolen uh, people will get people loggers come in and legally steal you know uh, 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 timber from their land basically as well huh. so it's 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 really wild and, and from inside in, in inside indigenous lands and you know it's you know rampant i guess and and just an opportunity missed recently to try and do the best practice stuff basically and that's the trade-off because, again, there is a demand for that for that timber, but there's no demand for the forest to be on fire. And so, so stopping fire is one of the, the thing. It's one of the lowest hanging fruit, basically, of, of problems to solve. Yes, and is it like w what role? Because you 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 said a lot about logging, but you also mentioned that the cattle and and the farmland is is, is because you can you often you often hear those. Um, messages like oh we need to rid of farming we need to rid of cattle and you know everybody go go vegan and that will say save amazonia how how much uh, true or how much uh, this is a, the problem or or you know like a demand for for beef let's say or feed for beef for that matter uh is a part of that problem yeah well i so i'm personally uh, i'm a vegetarian i only became a vegetarian having worked in Brazil for a long time. And I, I had a huge sort of long period of, of cognitive dissonance, if you like, you know, spending all that time working on Brazilian conservation issues and then spending all that time in Brazil and scoffing all this delicious, cheap uh, beef all the time. And, you know, amazing, <laughs> you know, amazing, super nice meat. And, 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 and so cheap. And that's the problem, right? Because it, it shouldn't be that cheap. Uh, and I think, you know, moving forward, if, if we're going to eat meat, which there are ways of producing meat in a sustainable fashion, we just have to eat a lot less of it. And, and the world can't take, you know, the amount of, of cheap beef that Brazil produces because it, it, it comes at a huge environmental cost. And, and it's not only just the cattle and it's being sort of supplanted in the Cerrado and in Southern Amazonia by soy, which is just more food for, for, for cattle elsewhere. 
that said, you know, there are ways to intensify production um, on the land which is already open uh, and increase production without cutting down more trees. And that should certainly be encouraged. But we should also look to, to diversify what's going on there as well. And from our own research, we know that often uh, ranchers have very low sort of quality of life, if you like. They report being quite unhappy, whereas people like growing coffee or doing other things often report to having much higher quality of life and enjoy what they're doing. But often there's a lack of expertise of how to transition to, to different forms of agricultural uh, gain and employment. And there are also these risks. So if you imagine you wanted to switch and grow coffee, well, you know, what about if your farmer is still, in, you know, essentially producing this cheap beef and still using fire as a tool to clean his pastures? What if that fire jumps into your plantation in the first year which you've established it? At that point, you're bankrupt. So the risks involved are often prohibitory for people because, you know, because of escape fires or just because of lack of knowledge or just cultural inertia. Then you know people don't know how to do different to do things differently, and we just get this sort of everyone doing the same thing, which is really extensive cattle ranching at a huge environmental cost. And we really need to educate people how to do different things. And there are multiple groups out there working on the challenges like this, and and there are some ranches which are going down the intensification route, uh, and that are entirely um, uh, in accordance with those laws. You know, eighty percent of their property is forest cover uh, and producing organic beef. You know. Obviously, there is that history of loss, but, you know, at least moving forward, they're, they're doing the right thing. So the, there are chances of, of making this making this work, but we just we just don't need any more forest loss. And indeed, we can't we just can't afford it because it will undermine what will happen if we lose much of eastern Amazonia. It will be the end of this monsoon rain system, which would collapse the entire breadbasket, if you like, in, in the southern part of South America. So at that point, the Amazonia is, is too big to fail. Interestingly, my, my last year I was living out there in 2015, the El Nino produced this massive drought. Uh, Sao Paulo, this sort of mega city of, of, of whatever it is, 35 million people, was coming close to, I can't remember what they call it, like day D, whatever it is, or, or day zero when they run out of water. Um, and at that time, like the Amazonian scientists were constantly on the news because we, we know exactly why you know, why, why the, the sort of the, um, these, what they call the flying rivers or Hewers Voyadores, the way they talked about them, this sort of monsoon push of, of rain and, you know, failing because of the, the dry, the prolonged dry season in, in Amazonia. And, you know, it was all the reservoirs were drying up in the south there and it were almost on the brink of civil unrest and the rains came at the last minute and, and who knows what happens next time. They will run out of water there. So it is on, on the political and the public conscious in Brazil, that sort of ecosystem service that Amazonia pr um, provides is incredibly important. And, and then we see other, so other forms of, of, of problematic infrastructure improvements like building roads and building these mega dams are in, incredibly environmentally costly. And it's like if we build these mega dams like Bella Manche in, in, in the eastern Amazon, we know that if you lose the forest cover, you lose the rains, and the damn thing would just be a, it's already a white elephant, but it won't even produce any electricity in 20 years if the rains fail. So the, it's just these really, really silly sort of investments. And so much of it is just tied to corruption. You know, it's like Bellamont costs billions of, of, of ice. And, you know, when you spend billions, you know, the opportunity to extract millions of ice as bribes and everything else is easy. And but why can't we just build much smaller dams on fourth order tributaries and you can still generate energy and we, and we can be strategic and we can limit the damage, but no, it's, it's mega dams, which will probably fail and cause, you know, a massive, massive environmental harm and, you know, extinction of fish species and a paper we published um, uh, a while back, it sort of showed these linkages between these mega dams and, and mining essentially. And the mega dams are really just to produce subsidized electricity for mining operations. So, um, in East Amazon, in East Amazon, has huge reserves of bauxite. Uh, the electrolysis of bauxite is used to produce uh, aluminium, and it's one of the most energy industrial processes on Earth. And, and the dam is being sold there is to solve the problems of local people, but it's not. It's just a electrolysis of bauxite, and we just should just be recycling aluminium and not looking to flood the global market with it, rather than you know than at this huge environmental cost. And and then what happens? You build the dam, all the people arrive. Uh, even if the dam only floods X amount of forest, you basically kickstart the whole deforestation process. It only takes one road to destroy a forest, basically. And there's a great YouTube video about that. And that's just this runaway process we see. And unless the government 
can control what's going on, then this huge drive for infrastructure improvements in South America, uh, new roads, new hydro vias, I mean, that could just, you know, it can do away with the continent very quickly. And we have to be so, so careful uh, uh, about letting these things happen because it's just a runaway, the, the side roads, and then you just lost control. Uh, up to this point, governments have been very poor uh, at maintaining that control. And, and the chances of it sort of coming back to sort of bite everyone else in the foot is so great that it's just what well, keeps them sort of up at night, if you like. Hmm. I like what you said, uh, the, the monsoon flying rivers. I, I heard that. Oh, that's not the, that's not the uh, great picture, to be honest. Um, one thing that I that I noticed that hit me that you said that I, I, here in, in, in Ireland and UK, uh, we talk about, there's a lot of talk about de-intensifying farming and be like more less intensive and less, this is more friendly for nature. Well, what you said is like the exactly opposite, like it's better for nature to intensify farming where you, where you already kind of have a land suitable for farming rather than, so it's kind of like a, a uh, great illustration like there the, it is the answer is always it depends what's it does, better yeah. what, and, what, what's, and what you talk about is a, what we call the land sharing land sparing paradigm and it, it varies where you are the thing is in in amazonia if the land you can potentially spare is untouched rainforest then its value is far far beyond the value of, of, of doing agriculture in a less intensive way i mean like a, a badly managed cattle pasture doesn't have that many more species than an intensively farmed cattle pasture. And it has millions less species than a rainforest. Whereas if you think about um, what our landscapes used to look like in Europe and like an, an extensive uh, um, farmland system might not be that different from, you know, uh, a sort of a, an ancient pre-human system with all rocks in, which essentially are cattle wandering around and, and you know you can the ecological linkages are there between those species, but in Amazonia it's it's you know a foreign cow species, which is essentially another relative. Uh, it's the, the 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 cows they use are these Brahma cattle, the big white ones, which are a domesticated version of the Eastern Asian auroch aurochs, right? Whereas our cattle we have in, in Western Europe are, are the the Western sub Western sort of subspecies or rocks and and we've moved them over there and they're eating a, a basically a, a domesticated species of African grass and you've transported it we built an entirely unnatural system, whereas you can work with with farming in in Western Europe to reduce systems which are quite biodiverse and uh, and you know and there is a there is a desire to do that uh, equally you know we've got to be very careful about intensifying in Amazonia to the extent which we end up destroying ecosystem services. So there is a, you know, you can have sort of shade grown coffee plantations, which have some forest species there. And, and then the coffee itself, you know, might get benefits from you know, bird species, you know, moving in and out of it or whatever. And again, it's not a rainforest, but th there's more than, we have to be careful. There's no one sort of single solution then. Again, as you were saying is, is what we're going to look at. But what we tend to find if uh, in Amazonia is at least that land's, Sparing is definitely a better option than, than sharing, although, again, being very careful about being sustainable by intensification. And, for instance, I've done some work on oil palm uh, in, in the Amazon Basin as well, which is, which is in expanding and isn't tending to sort of occupy to cause deforestation because it's normally areas that were used for cattle, then been bought up by oil palm companies. The trees have been planted on there. Oil palm is, is equally useless uh, for biodiversity, as is a, a field of cows in it, though there is um, a greater value for for carbon, you know, at least temporarily, uh, and it does produce more money. Uh, although there are also problems, uh, other all sorts of other sort of uh, social problems associated with that in some areas. We don't want to get into those, but you know, it's a bit of a it's a bit of a a minefield. But you know, there are different things that can be done, uh, and not all of it's bad. But the problem is at the moment, most of it is because we're just not doing it in a, in a, in a very joined up fashion. And that's the big, the big requirement is how do you build sustainable Amazon and, uh, and utilize the existing legislation we have uh, and just using the land which is already open. Uh, and then indeed encouraging reforestation areas, which are, are very poor for, for agriculture uh, and intensifying where we can, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. Are there any parts of, uh, of Amazonia that are, that are genuinely intact? That there was like there was no no people there ever, or is it like pretty much all already within the reach of 
bulldozers and loggers? Um, it's a good question. So we've lost about 20% of the rainforest. But then of the remaining 80%, you know, it's probably at least 50, and the 10 to 15% has been subject to, to fires and to selective logging, which happen as well within reserves. So the reserve system in Amazonia, which is exemplary, you know, like about 50% or over 50% of the basin is protected with reserves. But the problem is a lot of those reserves are kind of paper parks, you know, and the deforestation frontier has come up to them, arrives, and in some cases is going through them because without top-down governance, without environmental police, people cut it down or it burns or extracting timber, etc. cetera. Um, historically speaking, you know, there may have been people across most of it, you know, hunter-gatherer tribes moving around, obviously not having this huge impact that some of the more advanced civilizations had at, at the periphery, for instance. And there are still, you know, remote areas where people live there who have never, you know, even heard of a podcast or, or you know, <laughs> or, or know that COVID is affecting the rest of the world at the moment. And protecting the sociobiodiversity of those people is, is incredibly important. And there was, again, mentioning COVID, there was all sorts of uh, horrible stories coming out about apparently, you know, uh, deliberate attempts to try and, you know, deliver infectious diseases to these people because they become one of the sort of last stands essentially of uh, of uncontacted humanity uh, in these areas. So the area is still vast, but the rate at which it's been lost is incredibly quick. And the rate at which we're building new roads and potentially could usher in a new era of deforestation is also incredibly quick. So, uh, and you only have to look at um, a great website to look at is Google Earth Engine. So you can look at this time lapse change of uh, of the Earth's surface, and, and you play that back since 1984 in, in Amazonia, and it's you know it's incredibly shocking how quick uh, that change has been, essentially. Yeah, yeah. You almost, I almost like uh, dreading uh, people hearing like, oh, it's 20, oh, only 20 percent. Oh, sure, we're good to go. We have, we still have 80. But it's, uh, yeah. I well, presume at, we, yeah, at some we point. Yeah, we don't know exactly what you're going to, I think you're going to say is where that tipping point lies. And, and there, are, there are ecologists and climate scientists who uh, have come up with, you know, various estimates, uh, but we just, we just don't know. And it's, you know, we know that the, the dry season is lengthening. So when I started my PhD in, in, in 2004 there, speaking to farmers there, they were like, well, the dry season already lasts a month longer than it did when we arrived in, in the late 70s, for instance. A month. Yeah, in a month. Uh, and in other areas, it's pushing a month and a half. And, and that lengthening dry season, we're already seeing the loss uh, of, of various insectivorous bird species from those forests. Because that, that lengthening dry season means the leaf litter dries up and it means we lose sort of these insects associated with the, the more humid areas. And it, it becomes too much for bird species, which were just disappearing from forests, which are otherwise untouched. You know, no one's been there and, and changed it. It's just those local climate impacts from that lengthening dry season. And that will affect, it will affect agriculture, not just locally, but again, across, across Brazil. And those, those are the big sort of worries. And, and people talk about this Amazon forest dieback, which you know, could be 40, 50 years, you know, it's not gonna be 10, it could be a hundred years, but if it happens and the model suggests it will, unless we- So what is that dieback? Can you, can you explain what the dieback is? It means that we basically, the, the, the basin, the dry season will become too long to sustain rainforest. And we'd, we'd go towards a more dry forest type system or even a savanna type system, but we'd lose the, the structural complexity and we'd lose that tree species composition because they're, they're reaching this point to what we call this hydraulic stress. You know, they can no longer get the water they need. And we're seeing sort of mass mortality of trees, particularly in the south and east of the basin, which is most in, impacted by a regional deforestation and regional climate change, basically. And then especially the, the interaction with these fires, which are most prevalent in these El Nino events. So it's like, it's not horrendous forest fires every year. And again, I'm making a difference. These aren't the fires, not the, the deforestation fires. We're getting these horrendous forest fires in the big El Nino years because the forest is drying up, that it's become so dry that undisturbed forests have burned. And that, that undisturbed forest burning is only something we've been seeing in the last sort of 20 or so years. And people thought that these forests would never burn. But now they're sort of reaching that point of water stress that they are burning, basically, which is a huge, huge worry. And these fires have especially affected some of the areas that we've worked in, the Santorin region, 
uh, and we've got sort of ongoing experiments showing the sort of the changes in ecosystem services and, and, and biodiversity within some of our plots, which we've been monitoring through recurrent fires, basically. Wow. Oh, that's heavy stuff, Alex. Listen, yeah. um, tell me, uh, so talking about the future now, how do you, how do you see this uh, play out? Um, so, for, so I have a two questions. Like first, is, is really people like you involved in and interested from the ecological standpoint and, and, and in general with Amazon? Are you like really tracking what's going on politically in, a, in, a, in, a, in, in terms of political landscape in, in Brazil and, you know, hoping or, or just, you know, basically losing faith? And the second question is like, does it look like Perhaps, and you know that's probably a terrible thing to say, that once the impact, the climate impacts will be undeniable, like you, you know, mentioned, Sao Paulo, no water, three months, right, or or a month or a week, whatever it is, then someone will wake up and say like, oh, right, and then people like you said like they finally notice that, oh, there are people there who are telling us for the last, you know, two decades that this is going to happen and now they're going to listen. Yeah. I th well, so it, it, it is all about politics. I mean, it, 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 the entire problem of Amazonia is entirely a political one and it can be solved by politicians, essentially. And it will be solved by politicians when the public demand it be solved of them. And the problem at the moment is Brazil's got a huge fake news problem. And that sort of operation went into overdrive uh, with the fires crisis. And the president was denying any of this was happening. And really, I mean, the, the, the sort of the crisis had been smoldering on for ages. And it wasn't until like essentially Rio and Sao Paulo were black with smoke that 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 crisis became undeniable. And suddenly Bolsonaro was sending troops to the Amazon and, and waving his hands around and saying, right, we're going to fix this. And it will, I think it will take that sort of issue because, again, WhatsApp is a, bit, is a terrible tool for fake news in Brazil, but there's just all these stories going around that it's just gringos and it's gringos wanting to, 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 to go and take Amazonia and the NGOs and this, this culture of, of, of believing that, you know, that, that that's what's happening. And especially it didn't help when foreign people, uh, NGOs or, 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 or celebrities talk about the Amazon being... The property of the world, or whatever, because that plays into that narrative as well. And we have to make have to make sure that we're completely clear about, you know, that 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 um, that um, that you know the Amazonia pertains to Brazil and Peru, and it's that it's their their sovereign realm. But equally, you know, it does affect everyone else on the planet. What happens to that? So that doesn't mean that we can't put political pressure on uh, the, to 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 make sure that we get good environmental results. But certainly, we shouldn't play into those narratives about sending troops in or anything else because that just makes it just makes the problem worse essentially and there are there's a you know entirely Bra huge brazilian middle class clamoring for you know not wanting to have these environmental problems and, and in, in merging in sort of environmental ethic and an outrage really at what's going on but unless there are unless there is this presence of of in environmental boots on the ground in Amazonia, then there is no top-down control about this. And people would also always complain about the endemic corruption there, even, even when it was a lot better when I was doing my PhD, you know, sort of they'd have environmental agents would fly in a helicopter and there'd be some whiskeys drunk and, and, and a bribes exchange and someone flies off. And then I remember well, cause um, I used to pay uh, some, uh, a girl there to, to wash my clothes. Uh, and her father was, um, uh, a, a, trim, a truck driver, you know, moving moving the logs, and he had his like lorry confiscated, and it was just like to have something to sort of to say, well, we've done this job, but ultimately they let the guy off that that destroyed sixty thousand hectares of rainforest, and then penalised the little guy who's living on the breadline, essentially. <laughs> and that's that's the problem, and you'll have, you know, you might cut down a tree in an affluent suburb of Sao Paulo and have like seven environmental um, police descend on your house or whatever. Uh, and then, you know, people can destroy vast swathes of Amazonia. And it's just not really surprising that all the environmental staff have gravitated towards Sao Paulo because your chance of being shot 
for being environmental police in Amazonia are really high. So it's until those problems are fixed, the basic problems of governance, we don't get anywhere. And at the moment, we have you know a, um, politicians in power in Brasilia who who, who don't believe in environmental causes, uh, and are at real risk of, of shooting you know Brazil's future in the foot. And I think that there will be a reckoning. Uh, I hope. Um, that the voters will put them out and demand, you know, better of uh, Brazilian politics and indeed of Peruvian politics and, and and for the other Amazonian nations. Again, we've talked a lot about Brazil, which is again it's because of where I've I've worked. But it's also well, my question exactly. My, qu- my question exactly. We we focus on 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 the on Brazil, but there are other other countries that are also like like Peru. And how the situation looks like there is it similar? Do you know? Yeah. So um, again, I wrote a piece of the conversation recently because. Peru's also got sort of major road building investment going on. It's through this sort of big uh, overarching development fund for South America. There's a lot of Chinese money coming in. So the idea uh-huh. is building, building roads, be able to move soy out to ports in Peru and the Pacific, for instance, uh, to then ship that globally. Um, so there are these sort of teleconnections as well. Uh, the end of the sort of narco trafficking in in Peru and Colombia has has seen a spike in deforestation, uh, because you know the areas have become uh, less lawless, I guess. Uh, and again, uh, maybe they're doing a bit better job than, than parts of Brazil are doing at the moment. Ecuador has historically done very well. They they put out um, a few years ago a request the international community. You might remember uh, for them not to exploit oil reserves. And they wanted money, you know, from from global governments not to do that, and that money never came. So they're going on exploiting these oil resources. Again, it comes it comes to a question: Are we prepared to pay as a, a global society for uh, for Amazonia to be the reserve of the world? You know, if we want that, we have to pay for it. And I think that's also a, a fair point. Uh, so investing in uh, investing in protecting Amazonia must mean sort of paying for that avoided development, I guess, in, in many cases, and. I guess our power as consumers, you and I, is is in not buying products which come with deforestation. And uh, some of the efforts by the more sort of radical NGOs like Greenpeace have been very successful. They're slaughtering the Amazon campaign, you know, sort of making sure that that companies which are importing sort of leather and, and or beef from areas in refor- recent deforestation were being boycotted. And that was very successful in, in making sure that if those products are coming out, they're coming from best best practice areas as well. So I think consumers and, and, and our power as, as consumers and voters is incredibly important in all this. And and we can exercise that power, you know, from afar as well. But ultimately it's Brazilians who who have the power to sort of vote in and out the the people. Yeah. Uh, can you give us an example of the of the products that 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 comes from this unsustainable uh like leather leather I mean just not just beef but like leather in trainers for instance or or, or timber products, uh, you know, multitude really of, of possible products which are born on recent deforestation. Soy has been the big one. And uh, a great friend of mine, Toby Gardner, who's one of the co-founders of this um, uh, sustainable Amazon project, which I work uh, alongside um, Joss Barlow and Joyce Fajera and Erica Beringer, and Felipe Franco, Celia Viana uh, and others. Um, he's working now on this uh, platform called Trace, which essentially is tracking global commodity flows. Uh, and that's a key tool to understand where what's driving deforestation and to hold big companies, you know, like Cargill, basically, uh, to, to, to write about, you know, where their product is coming from and, and showing what's the on-the-ground impact. And, and those sorts of platforms are incredibly powerful because you know you can show the consumer this is the impact of, of the of what you put on your plate or or what you wear on your feet and such like and that's the way that's the way to go really and I think you know we need to be very careful about the sort of one size fits all uh, meat is bad and I'm saying that as a vegetarian because you know there are ways of producing meat with a minimal impact but it will require we eat a lot less of it and 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 broadly speaking in agriculture it's about uh, quite often e- eating locally but about eating seasonally uh, and, and eating less meat but higher welfare and, and meat which delivers biodiversity and we can do these sort of things but it, it does require diet shifts and it requires people you know to change what they do and, and many people are not prepared to to pay for that but you know the cost is you know is globally uh, it is huge and um i'm happy to support you know farmers in south america producing sustainable beef on on 
areas and the southern cone on, on temperate grassland areas and there are there are schemes that do that and, and can deliver you know sort of biodiversity friendly beef in south america just as we can we can do that uh, at home in in western europe but you know a lot of what we produce isn't and because it's cheaper for instance and uh, and that's why at the moment i don't you know sort of i don't buy any beef because you know there's the market for those other products is so small uh, that i can i think i can do without it and for those that feel they can't they can buy into that product which is which causes less environmental harm i think that's the way we have to go sort of moving forward basically yeah absolutely listen uh if anyone is listening to that and um all that that you said kind of makes him want to take an action well you know what would you like you obviously touch already on that be be more aware what you consume and i guess this is like a kind of overarching advice these days like be aware where uh you know how much you consume why where it comes from and 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 uh, you know try to make sustainable choices which is probably a whole other uh subject um but specifically uh when we talk about Amazonia, when we talk about logging, when we talk about, um, it, it almost feel like, you know, uh, being engaged in some sort of a political movement would be the most successful way of, of um, helping the cause. So what would you recommend to, to people who, you know, they probably not gonna travel uh, to, but they, they, they have um, disposable income and they can use that <laughs> in a good way what do you what's your recommendation so there's multiple avenues there and I think there's no single sort of right answer that i could say the best possible investment but um some of the major big end international ngos like conservation international nature conservancy wwf um have some very good amazonian programs and obviously they're also huge sort of um they can produce some amazing things but they're also sort of huge behemoth organizations as well probably with some inefficiencies so quite often, you know, supporting some of the much smaller community-based product uh, projects can also be be really, really impressive. And uh, uh, I'm not familiar with many of them. A good one uh, that I uh, that I've come across recently is the the hedge you just mentioned, the Shingu, the the Shingu Seed Network, which sort of brings together indigenous people collecting and, uh, and planting seeds, and then selling those seeds to to farmers for for restoration programs, for instance. So that network has uh, restored like six and a half thousands of hectares of, uh, of degraded forests in, in the Shingu and Anaguaya basins in, in, in southeastern Amazonia. Uh, and like generated, I think it's like four or five million hay ice from those pro uh, projects, employing all these indigenous collectors and, and sort of valuing those resources. And then we talked about the value of that. Well, that's for those farmers who have deforested more than they should have done and helping to bring them back in compliance so that, and there are other sorts of grassroots uh, projects like that, and it's sort of hunting those down and investing those. I think is very important. But I think again across these different NGOs, I mean Greenpeace can often get have often got it quite wrong in Amazonia, but they've often got it quite right as well. You know, perhaps in some cases they've made our life quite difficult by, by some of the sort of really sort of not having the right nuance, perhaps, for some of the campaigns. But equally, the, the sort of the, the slaughtering the Amazon you know, campaign as well did work quite well in being a consumer-directed thing rather than sort of direct action on the ground. And and those can work. And, and just like supporting the big NGOs who are attempting to to or either acquire land or or help help local governments' goals in terms of getting land tenure. You know, there's no there's no one. All of these actions are, are sort of extremely important, basically, and and supporting the science as well to to make sure we've got the evidence to, to make these decisions too is also in, in incredibly important. And we do that here via taxes, which you know go to pay for science through through NERC and through other uh, initiatives as well. So you know, all of us do already doing our bit to an extent, but certainly searching out. I think my best advice would be searching out some of these smaller initiatives, which you know, often have fewer inefficiencies and are producing some, you know, great results on the ground and sort of by indigenous people or by Brazilians or for Brazilians. Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a good advice. Alex, uh, that's that's fantastic conversation. I don't know if you, if there is anything else that you would like to uh, touch on or or maybe leave us with any uh, final final thoughts. I think, well, some of the final thoughts are connected back, I think, to a certain extent about the sort of lessons from Amazonia in, in terms of what we should be doing here as well. And I, 
there's you know the sort of the rewilding angle you know it has its detractors i guess in, in terms of restoration and uh, and some people get upset about the notions of what you can and can't do on your land. But I think it, it comes back to that question of we, if you are a landowner, and especially if you own a lot of land, it does come with a great deal of responsibility uh, to other people and to the planet about what happens there and, and trying to, to do your bit uh, to restoring biodiversity and restoring ecosystem services, I think is important. And I hope that the sort of the next generation of uh, subsidies regimes will go on to to pay people to do that rather than to sort of pay for some of the sort of negative environmental externalities we, we've seen at the moment. I, I doubt we'll ever arrive at sort of Brazilian style top down stipulation about what you must have. But I think certainly think, you know, uh, if we can get to the point where, you know, we'll only pay you if you do deliver. I think that's a, a, at least a much better position than the one we have at the moment. Uh, and I think people are increasingly aware of that. And, and I hope, you know, that people will uh, be given the opportunity to deliver more and to, to have more in sort of environmentally friendly farming and forestry uh, uh, and hunting, etc. And I think all of these, there are ways to harmonize all of these goals, but they have to deliver biodiversity and ecosystem services, basically, or we certainly don't think we should be they shouldn't be receiving any taxpayer funds uh, for that. That's that's my take on that, certainly. And I think Brazil is ahead when it comes to those, that sort of visionary environmental legislation about what what we what we think, you know, that responsibility of being a landowner is, you know. Hmm. Fantastic. Alex, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure talking with you. Okay, yeah, thank I really you. enjoyed it as well. And thank you for the chat.